Our relationship with fire has mainly been forgotten in the modern day era. Nowadays, we have the luxury of heating, furnaces, microwaves, gas and electric stoves, coal fired power plants, and electricity. It's crazy just to think that we have the command of fire at the tip of our hands with a simple flick of a fluid lighter. With that thought in mind, imagine showing off your Baker Grill lighter to your prehistoric ancestor. They would probably go nuts and think you had magical powers of some kind. We go day to day in our lives without a thought of having to worry about making a fire to meet our daily needs. Today we take this relationship with the flames for granted. Thus, over the years, the ancient methods of fire making are long gone, except now, only done while camping once a year or for hobby. Even now, most people don't know how to properly start a fire. The manipulation and production of fire is an exclusively human trait. No other animal on earth makes fire and cooks their food with it. Taming fire is what made us human. Without it, our species may have never evolved or existed. How and when our ancestors mastered the flames is still a hotly debated question. It is widely accepted by scholars that the taming of fire has been attributed to our genus Homo and first used by Homo erectus. Before the flames were tamed, it is very likely that the earliest encounter with fire occurred with early hominins being scared of fire. These were naturally caused fires such as savannah wildfires, lightning, and volcanoes. Eventually, a brave and curious hominin came across some flames and harnessed it and learned of its powerful abilities such as to scare off predators, see in the dark, cook food, and provide warmth and protection. This scenario almost reminds me of the Greek myth of Prometheus, a titan who stole fire from the gods and brought it to mankind. It's fun to visualize that perhaps a prehistoric hominin felt this way by taking fire from something so scary and powerful such as a lightning strike. In that sacred moment, they must have felt like demigods. During this time period of over one million years ago, Homo erectus would have coexisted with Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis, and Paranthropus boisei. There would have been possibly been groups of hominins who had the knowledge of harnessing wildfire and other hominin species who didn't, which also may have contributed to their extinction due to Homo erectus and their technological advances. Hominins who had the fire would have had to keep any remaining embers from their fire from going out, otherwise they would have to wait and source another flames elsewhere somehow. This is maybe also why evidence is scarce in the archaeological record, as fire may have been a very special occasion in the beginning. With Homo erectus acquiring the flame, it gave them the chance to be the first human species to colonize the world. This gave them the nickname International Man. They spread from Africa to up north to Europe and all of Asia. Europe and Northern Asia being a colder climate at the time, it would have made sense they acquired fire to keep them warm throughout the harsh ice age. The oldest evidence comes from Wonderwork Cave in South Africa that is dated to one million years old. Archaeologists have found preserved ash, burnt grass, leaves, brush, and bone fragments. Evidence for the oldest known hearth is found in Kisim Cave, Israel. It is dated to 300,000 years old. In the center of the cave there is a pile of wood ash. Here they also found burnt bones, flint, and bits of burnt clay, all located near the hearth. This indicates that there was butchering and cooking of an animal involved here. This cave was also used repeatedly over time for a large group of people. It is completely possible that percussion techniques came before friction techniques. I say this because other human species before ours have been hitting stone for a very long time. It is possible that other species such as Neanderthals have found out to make fire this way. The method is by striking flint and pyrite to generate a spark that will fall onto a fluffy pile of tinder such as using a polyporous mushroom and eventually catching flame. This was the precursor to the flint and steel. Also, just look at how ridiculous this is. How fast the flame catches. Psh. It is a video game after all. Another fun archaeological fact is that over 5,000 years ago in the Otsol Alps, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, Otzi the Iceman 
was found with a fire kit that included flint, pyrite, and birch polyphor fungus for tinder. This art is mainly seen in the northern range of the North American continent, predominantly used by Arctic indigenous peoples. The Canadian and Algonquin striped two pieces of pyrites together over an eagle's thigh, dried with its down and serving instead of tinder. Apparently, the extinct indigenous group, the Beothooks of Newfoundland, did the same. Up north in Inuit areas, tinder is made from the down from the stems and catkins of various dwarf arctic willows. In Point Barrow, Alaska, the northernmost tip of the United States, pyrite is found here in spherical masses of various sizes up to several pounds in weight. In an old Inuit tale, they believe pyrite came down from above in meteors and call it firestone. In old times, they did not use flint, but only two pieces of pyrite, and they achieved big fire. In the Arctic highlands of northwest Greenland, Eskimos of Anotok struck fire from two stones, one being quartz and the other pyrite. The Aleutian Islanders used not only the bow drill, but the stone method as well. A stone containing quartz or pyrites is struck against another on a dried pile of seabird waste sprinkled with powdered sulfur. The natives who told explorer Lucian M. Turner this information said that this was the ancient way. Since we are in the northern regions, I am moving on to the bow drill. The bow drill is the most complex of the ancient fire making methods due to its required materials. The bow drill has four main parts to its kit. One, the bow with a sturdy strong string, the fire spindle or drill, the bearing block to hold the spindle in place, the material could be either wood or stone, and then the hearth board. Other materials will include the ember pen to catch dust in the ember, and then a tinder pile which is where the ember will go burst into flames. Where in the world has the bow drill been used? Bow drills have been used in North America and Egypt. I will just focus on North America in this video, so sorry Egypt. Anyways, bow drills have been mainly used in Northern North America, particularly the Inuit cultures. Chukchis and Ostiaks used the bow drill as well. Sorry if I butchered that pronunciation. Moving on. In the south of the American Arctic, the Sioux made use of the bow to increase speed of the drill. They did not use the thong with handles, nor was the bow common amongst them. The Inuit use a mouthpiece for the bearing block that isn't found anywhere else in the world. The mouthpiece can be made from various resources such as a block of wood, ivory, a simple concave vertebra of a fish, or even the astragalus of a caribou. The Inuit are true masters of craftsmanship and show off great pride and effort and detail in their art. They typically carve bears, seals, whales, and walruses into their objects. The seal is the most common. These animals are of great importance to the Inuit as they play a major role in their daily life. These animals contribute to their diet, clothing, beliefs, and survival. In the upper part of the mouthpiece is almost always worked out into a block, forming a grip for the teeth. The piece is intended to be held in the hand or in both hands, hence it has no teeth grip. In the under part is a piece of stone in which is hollowed out a cup-shaped cavity to hold the head of the drill. The stone is selected for their anti-friction properties. This includes mottled stone, marble, or obsidian. The drill is always short and thick, usually the same kind of wood as the fireboard, which is also any suitable wood. There are a couple of different styled hearth boards that the northern indigenous peoples use. The central hole hearth are found in north coast Alaska, insular British America, and Greenland exclusively. The stepped hearth with edged holes and slots is more common in western Alaska. Both ways are sometimes used in the same tribe. It is found that these different ways are due to environmental modification. The step on the hearth is to keep the pellet off of glowing powder from falling off into the snow which is universal in Inuit land. The central hole hearth is when a second hole is bored connecting with the first, making it receptacle for the powder. 
The thong or bowstring is made out of rawhide of seal or other animals. The handles for the string are usually made out of bear's teeth, hollow bones, or bits of wood. The bow itself are made typically from the tusks of walrus. These tusks have a natural curve which make them suitable. Here are some cool authentic examples of Inuit bow drill bows. They depict a hunting scene of their active hunting life in the Arctic. It doesn't get any cooler than this. Now I will briefly discuss the most famous fire making method of all time, the hand drill. Nothing else comes in mind when people think of starting a fire without any tools or lighters. That would be rubbing two sticks together. Surprisingly, this technique is still used to this day by other groups of people around the world and is in fact the most common well-known method. It is common in parts of the world where it is a warm and dry environment. It is predominantly used by indigenous peoples of Australia, Africa, North, and South America. The two-piece basic setup makes it an easy accessible kit to assemble. All is needed is two bone dry pieces of dead wood with no moisture. This also applies to other friction fire methods. The spindle is typically tall and slender and used from dead plant stalks. The fireboard is typically made from dead dry soft wood. What type of plant or wood varies on the region it is done. I will briefly share different uses of this method from several different tribes around the world. In the Pacific Northwest of North America, tribes here used redwood, setter, and Douglas fir. In this image, a Kwakiutl man makes a fire and prays, please come fire, according to the photographer. Villagers tried to keep at least one fire burning so coals could be borrowed. Traveling men carried a long coil of rope smoldering at the end. This makes sense, since the environment they were in was wet all the time. The Hoopa tribe of California make their fire hearth of a reddish punky piece made from the roots of willow or of cottonwood roots. The drill is made from the root of willow mentioned. The Paiutes of southern Utah made their hearths of a short rounded piece usually of the sapwood of juniper. It is tied to the drill with a thong buckskin when not in use. The small two hold hearth of rounded form and the shortened splice drill are for convenience of carrying. This kind is used by hunters while being away from their lodges. Paiute men do not usually make the fire except when out on a hunting trip. At the lodge, it is the squaw's duty to make fire when needed. Apaches and Navajos make their hearts out of the yucca flower stalk. The hand drill is found in South America just as abundantly as it is found in North America. In Brazil, the Angyatis look somewhat of the Hobies. They use the throat skin of the Nandu bird for a tinder sack. So why did they use this bird for storing their tinder? That is an interesting question. It could be a cultural thing. Who knows? The Ainus of Japan have formally used the hand drill prior to using flint and steel. A few are yet preserved and used in the temples on special occasions such as festivals of the Oyashiro to produce fire and cooking food offered to the gods. The fire kit from the Oyashiro temple at Izumo was the hearthboard was made from Hinoki cypress wood and the spindle made from the Diutsia plant. In eastern equatorial Africa, the Watavieta have an interesting custom. It was considered an, an exclusive privilege of the men and the secret is handed down from father to son and never any conditions revealed to women. The picture below shows how people of the great Bantu stock made fire. The majority of Africa has the same two-piece methods of creating fire. Well folks, I could go on and on about this topic. If you've made it this far watching this video, I would like to say thank you. I have put many hours into research and editing to produce this educational video. It was certainly fun to make and I will gladly take any positive feedback. If you enjoyed and would like to see more content like this, please hit that like and subscribe button and check out my other videos. Till next time.